delay, um, but I would like to welcome everybody to this side event of the World um, Circular Economy Forum. Um, good morning to you all, first of all, and welcome. My name is Martin Porter. I'm executive chair of CSL Europe, and it's my pleasure to moderate and facilitate this event with you all today. Um, I'm checking with my colleagues that everything is working, and I think I can see faces that tell me the technology is now uh, enabling me to be seen and heard. Uh, that's correct, I think, yes. In which case, I hope um, that we can also uh, begin by sharing um, an outline of the agenda that we have today, uh, which, as I hope everyone will already be aware, includes a number of excellent speakers who will be able to give us perspectives of how this agenda has developed over the past five years at EU level, um, the latest of the scientific evidence about what we need to do at EU level to respond more effectively to it, and then ideas from businesses and those uh, companies at the um, forefront of trying to work on this issue, particularly those who are involved in the task force on circular materials and products uh, that we have set up uh, as part of the Corporate Leaders Group Europe, uh, where we have a number of representatives who will be able to give us examples and perspectives from their side. So with that, I hope uh, there is an agenda that we can uh, share. I can't see it yet, but um, uh, once we have that, I think we can hopefully proceed. Um, in the meantime, let me just... Uh, So just so everybody is fully aware, obviously that means that you need to be aware the content uh, will be available for public consumption uh, and uh, you should be aware of that obviously in any comments that you make, uh, that they will be um, published online and indeed accessible for, for others. Um, I will ensure that uh, with my colleagues, I'm keeping an eye on the chat and when we come to the question and answer sessions, we will be able to include as many of those comments or questions that we see online in the interaction that we have with uh, our colleagues and our speakers. So uh, if you do have uh, ideas or perspectives that you want to uh, share, then please do, uh, do your best to, to let us know. Um, and I will uh, endeavour to ensure that some of you will be able to, to make those comments uh, directly as well. Um, I do know that uh, one of our uh, first speakers is going to have to leave before the end, and therefore I'll, I'll make sure that we're able to um, uh, give him the opportunity to respond to questions before he has to do so. Um, and I hope that that covers the, the, the rest of the um, uh, administrative side, let's say, of this meeting. Um, just a couple of bits of background in addition, while well, hopefully the, uh, the slides uh, will appear before us. Um, the work that we do as CISL Europe uh, is uh, in particular to facilitate discussions and dialogue between uh, the university and our network, uh, businesses and policymakers. And as part of that, uh, the Corporate Leaders Group Europe has been set up um, over a decade ago to provide um, a platform for progressively minded, active companies uh, working at the interface of climate change and business and sustainability to advance these agendas uh, with policymakers and a task force that we have set up, the companies, uh, members of which you see uh, indicated uh, on the screen before you, are active in pursuing particularly the link between the circular economy and these agendas. Um, the task force obviously therefore is looking at how to generate ideas that are going to be um, helpful to policymakers, but informed by practical experience and perspectives of leading companies who have uh, a lot to offer in terms of ideas, experience um, and indeed capacity to help advance uh, this agenda. Um, and in doing that, obviously now we're coming together at a time where we're able to take stock of what we have been doing both in the task force, but also in the wider European and indeed global 
uh, context uh, over the last five year uh, institutional cycle uh, for the European Union level and to take stock of that and to look forward to what the next five years offers once we have uh, had the European elections and we're clear what the composition of the new European Parliament will be, but also obviously what that means for the European Union's agenda, the way the European Commission advances that uh, and how that uh, will, will therefore look as of the end of this year uh, and for five years to come. So we hope that this uh, discussion is obviously timely from that perspective and uh, we're very pleased to therefore be able to uh, welcome you all to, to join it with us. Um, if we uh, can, can we quickly move to the uh, agenda again now? Um, and uh, we'll quickly see what the, the format, if you want, that we're going to run through this morning will be. Uh, my colleague, uh, Diana Potjomkina, will give us a quick um, overview of the past five years, a sort of mini stock take. So we're all on the same page before hearing from Peter Willem Lemons, who's kindly joined us from the European Scientific Advisory Board on Climate Change, who've done an excellent report um, on this, which he will uh, summarize and present to us, after which um, we will have a short Q&A because he will need to leave us before the end of the, the session. We will then move to hearing from uh, three members of the um, uh, task force that I mentioned, uh, from Ball, Saint-Gobain and Rockwell, uh, and we're very lucky to have the three people that you see mentioned here, Claudia Bierth, Céline Carré and Katarina Roca, who will set out uh, ideas and perspectives from their companies on this. Um, and then uh, we'll conclude that session with uh, Eduardo Bodo from uh, Reuse, our Reuse, um, uh, an NGO working uh, on this issue and being, who will give us another perspective on it as well. After that, we'll obviously go to the question and answer uh, session. Uh, and we'll be sure that we conclude uh, by uh, 11.30 so that um, we're within time and my job will be to make sure therefore that we run all of that with that perspective in mind. So with no further ado, uh, I'd like to pass over to my colleague Diana who can give us uh, a perspective on what we have seen for the last five years, a stock take. So Diana, welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Martin. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Diana Potemkin. I'm project manager for the Materials and Products Task Force. Also working on uh, a new uh, research project, uh, which aims to set the political agenda for the next uh, five years for the EU institutions on circular economy. Uh, could you please share the next slide? Um, so uh, this event is actually coming early on in this process of um, developing our research project um, as a task force uh, aiming to provide a business perspective, um, progressive business perspective on action and ambition concerning the development of circular economy in the EU. Uh, we have just started the work, um, so for us this is also a very valuable um, opportunity to uh, hear from you, uh, hear from our speakers and hear from our participants and um, take on board uh, your comments and ideas. So any comments and ideas are very welcome. Uh, you can put them in the chat and I will also share my email address afterwards if you would like to get in touch and discuss the research project. Um, but um, yes, um, so um, we are thinking to uh, take stock of different dimensions which can serve as either neighbors or obstacles for circular economy development in the European Union so as you see on the slide, governance, um, implementation, including demand, for example, for circular products, financing and investment, uh, social di dimension, jobs, um, social justice and the international dimension. And um, we um, aim to provide, uh, as I mentioned, a business perspective on the side of the task force. There have been some very interesting and valuable events, sorry, publications uh, coming out lately, for example, a report um, uh, by uh, Unomia, Zero Waste and others, or the European Environmental Agency uh, report on uh, accelerating circular economy in the EU. Uh, in this case, uh, our strength as a task force is convening businesses um, who are in their daily operations working on um, materials and products. Um, and um, our added value is also providing this business view. 
Um, next slide, please. Um, so the importance of circular economy in the EU. Um, we are all no doubt aware of um, uh, of this, uh, but I think it is also important to recap uh, a bit um, to set the scene also for this uh, discussion for this research project. So these are all um, aspects which appear in the European Union's own policy documents, and uh, these are all aspects which uh, Materials and Products Task Force has highlighted in different publications, um, which we have released. Um, there are um, absolutely imperative reasons for developing circular economy and um, accelerating its uptake in the EU. Um, resilience um, in the context, especially of international growing competition for um, raw materials. Here I would mention Materials and Products Task Force 2023 report on circular um, raw materials act, uh, which highlights that circularity is a very important strategy in particular also for ensuring security of supply and relying less on imports and um, relying more on um, um, using and um, reusing materials inside the European Union itself. Uh, climate objectives, uh, as per famous Ellen MacArthur Foundation statistics, um, energy efficiency only accounts for 55% of the emissions, and it is not possible to address the other 45% if we do not um, deal with uh, decarbonization of products, services and systems. And um, as we now know, uh, the European Union is actually looking at decreasing emissions um, for around 90% by 2040, um, which means that circular economy is absolutely essential for reaching our climate goals. Broader environmental impact, including biodiversity, because extraction of raw materials has um, also broader impacts and um, this can be minimized if we decrease uh, the demand for primary materials and rely more on circularity instead. Creation of jobs, there is famous statistics in the circular economy action plan of 2020 that um, circular economy can help create 700,000 new jobs across the EU by 2030. Uh, sustainable macroeconomic econo uh, growth and um, long-term competitiveness. Um, so, um, uh, the Circular Economy Action Plan mentioned that um, we could increase the GDP by seven uh, by 0 0.5 percent by 2030, and we also found ourselves in the global race to net zero, in which um, competitiveness is um, um, increasingly um, in the context of um, global race towards sustainability, and they are tightly linked. And microeconomic benefits, of course, for individual companies, it can mean um, increased profitability, it can mean uptake of new business models, and our uh, task force members will also be talking about that later. Next slide, please. So if you look at the general timeline um, of circular economy in the EU, again, um, well-known facts, uh, but I think it could be interesting to recap. Um, obviously, work on circularity has started um, already before 2015, but we have seen um, some uh, good uptake in the recent years. Um, um, circular economy in 2019 has been mentioned as a priority in the European Green Deal, um, even though, uh, in fact, uh, as European Environmental Agency wrote the same year, um, it was still in its infancy in the European Union. Uh, we have seen the adoption of the circle, second circular economy action plan in 2020. And um, uh, by the way, we, our research report is also with a view uh, to potentially the next circular economy action plan in 2025. Um, we have seen also that um, as European Court of Auditors has pointed out, European Commission is um, systematically mainstreaming now circular economy in its various legislative proposals, and I will mention some of them um, a bit later. We also see progress on the national level um, because um, in 2015, um, uh, none of the EU member states had a circular economy strategies, and um, by 2022, this number has increased to 23. These are data of the European Environmental Agency. Uh, at the same time, um, circular economy, while there are increasing attempts to regulate it on um, uh, the European level, and there are some um, policy initiatives uh, which are binding or will become binding, 
much of it still depends on the individual member states. Um, and um, what we see here is that the situation is still um, quite different um, in the member states. And um, as the European Court of Auditors highlighted in their special report in 2023, um, um, there are uh, there is quite weak uptake um, in, um, in in many EU member states. Um, so the next slide, please. Um, so the overall trend, I would say, uh, from my perspective, again, um, this is not a definitive stock take, and um, we are still working on this. Uh, this is more my um, uh, personal, um, how to say, conclusions um, on this matter. Uh, we have seen some positive trends uh, in the European Union, um, but the progress is still patchy. Uh, we see increasing interest uh, by both national and EU policymakers. Um, uh, in circular economy, as well as from investors, individual businesses and consumers. Um, we have had uh, quite a lot of positive examples, um, also highlighted um, in uh, materials and products task force uh, research reports, uh, positive case studies from individual businesses, um, which um, help both um, meeting climate goals, um, generate employment and um, uh, secure business operations and um, uh, improve profitability. Uh, so we see also rising consciousness um, around the board of the importance of circular economy. Uh, we have seen some important policy advancements on the European level. Uh, and if you look at circular economy, what is important is to address um, emissions uh, across the entire product life cycle. So before use, during use and after use. And we have seen that the European Union has been addressing all of these stages um, with some uh, very important um, cross um, legislations with cross sectoral impact, for example, eco design requirements for sustainable products, uh, which also includes digital product passport, which uh, was the subject of another materials and products task force report. Uh, green claims and right to repair, all of these are almost finalized at the moment. And there have also been some sectoral advancements, uh, for example, in packaging and packaging waste. And um, so um, these um, initiatives, um, most of them have not been quite finalized yet. And so we do not really see practical impact yet um, in real life, but uh, we will see it um, hopefully in the coming years. And um, also um, several independent reports have highlighted that they use leadership on circular economy um policy wise um could be acknowledged positively um we also see increasing number of policy actions targeting higher steps in the waste hierarchy originally there was criticism that we focus more on waste management and not so much on for example reuse or prevention uh, but we see um increasing attempts on to address that and um, what we also see in the eu is relative decoupling of economic growth from waste generation which shows that transition to circular economy and reducing waste um, does not mean that we need to compromise on um, also our economic objectives. Uh, but next slide. Um, so there are um, also some challenges uh, which the EU is facing and um, other speakers uh, will be speaking about those as well. Um, but what we see is um, uh, still largely uh, linear economic model in the European Union. So we need much more um, radical uh, change in, um, in our consumption patterns and in our economic model. We also see growing consumption levels um, overall. Uh, we see that circular material use rate uh, is growing much uh, more slowly than what is needed um, to reach the EU zone. Um, goals by 2030 to double the circular material use rate. Uh, I know this is also the subject um, mentioned in the European Scientific Advisory Board on Climate Change report. Um, um, we have uh, quite large discrepancies among the member states, as has been mentioned before. Uh, one issue which has been highlighted in, in various reports um, is um, insufficient demand side measures uh, to generate demand. Um, for um, circular materials and products, uh, and in particular, green procurement and circular procurement have not been um, harnessed enough um, to unlock this um, potential um, of, um, of purchasing more um, 
circular materials and products. And uh, what we see also politically at the moment uh, with all the discussions in the EU is that there is a tendency to decouple competitiveness um, from um, um, climate action and from circularity, for example, even though uh, these two are actually inextricably linked. Um, we have a certain risk that circularity might um, be um, at some point deprioritized and what we also need is more ambitious targets um, also on the national level to maintain this ongoing progress to more circular economy. Um, finally, also uh, the need to get citizens and consumers more fully on board, address possible societal disruptions, also materials and products task force has published a report on, um, on uh, the impact of circularity on jobs. And um, as the European Environmental Agency has mentioned um, in its uh, latest report, the likelihood of reaching the EU's 2030 targets is either low or moderate. So um, these were some thoughts uh, to set the scene about um, the tendencies in the EU's circular economy. As I mentioned before, next slide, please. Um, um, I would be uh, very happy to uh, hear your opinions uh, and considerations um, concerning this topic. I will also leave my email address in the chat. And um, yeah, thank you so much, everyone. And I look forward to the discussion and all the outcomes of the discussion will be very valuable for our research project as well. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you indeed very much uh, for that. It's a great um, tour d'horizon, I think, of uh, the circular economy uh, from a European Union in perspective in particular. Um, and I would underline what you said, Diana, about our um, keenness to have everyone's input on this. Uh, the process is underway uh, and the report that we produce will no doubt be much stronger the more that we incorporate perspectives, um, ideas, uh, details and facts and so on that, that you share with us. So please uh, do get in touch with us afterwards. Um, let us now hear from another expert who uh, has been at the heart of the uh, the recent uh, research and study that the um, European Scientific Advisory Board on Climate Change has produced. So Peter Willem uh, Kemans, um, we are very happy to welcome you. I hope that you are able to see us and we can move to the next slide. But um, uh, there we go. Everyone can see who you are. Um, and um, the floor, I hope, is now yours, assuming that you're able to um, uh, let us know you're there. Yes, good Peter Willem. Good morning, Martin. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome, I can welcome. hear you and I can see you and I hope the same goes in the other direction that you can see and hear me. Yes, so, perfect. Thank you. OK, great. Well, good morning to everyone here uh, and thank you so much for the invitation, the opportunity for me to present the European Scientific Advisory Board's uh, on climate change work of the recent years. Um, what I would like to do today is just give a very brief overview of the advisory board's uh, main reports published uh, since it was established three years ago with a sp specific focus on circular economy. Um, as you will hear throughout my presentation, which will be quite brief, my message is basically the same as what Diana has just told. If I can sum it up in four points, it is that circular economy can make a major contribution to achieving climate objectives. That's one point. Second point is progress so far has been very limited. A third point would be that uh, steps have been taken in the right direction, at least on paper. But then a fourth point would be that now it, uh, of course, all comes down to putting those paper improvements into practice and to implement uh, what we intend to implement. If I can sum it up, I think that resonates quite well with uh, the overview that Diana has just given us. Um, so if we can go to the next slides, uh, my presentation today will be based on two major reports of the advisory boards. Um, as you all know, the EU is currently at the crossroads of two pol important policy cycles. We have seen uh, a lot of movement on uh, the Fit for 55 package and the broader European Green Deal to put the EU on track towards 55% by 2030. But at the same time, we also see that the policy cycle on the objective for after 2030 uh, is starting now, especially since the Commission has proposed its 2040 or 
put forward is recommended 2040 uh, objective. And in this context, the advisory board has published two main reports. One was published in June last year, uh, where we gave advice on a 2040 objective. Um, and that report is really about uh, targets. Where should we go? Uh, and then the second report was published earlier this year in January, um, and that's about progress and policy consistency. So it's more on how do we need, what do we need to do to get there? So those will be the two reports which will be the, the, the source of my presentation today. I will keep it very brief, but if you are interested, there is a lot more detail in these two. Um, let's uh, start with the first one. If we can go to the next slide very briefly, uh, the first report on a recommended 2040 objective. What has the advice board uh, found and, and recommended? Well, if you take into account both feasibility and fairness, then the advice board has recommended to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 90 to 95 percent by 2040 uh, compared to 1990. And even this, that's the maximum feasible range, even this uh, would not be fully uh, sufficient to address fairness. So on top of that, the EU should also support action outside the EU and aim for net negative emissions after 2050 uh, to bridge this gap. Just as a scene setter, this is what the advisory board recommended. And we see now that the Commission has largely followed this recommendation by recommending a 90% reduction objective. Now, if we go to the next slide, and this is where it becomes a bit more relevant for the agenda today. Uh, in this report, the advisory board has also assessed different pathways to get there. Um, and they took in particular a close look at three iconic pathways, so three differentiated approaches to get there. One is very much focused on this demand side measures, which focuses on a uh, less resource intensive approach to get there, and that can be achieved both through circular economy, but also through lifestyle changes. They've also looked at a high renewable energy pathway, so with a high emphasis on not addressing demand that much, but more putting the focus on supply and cleaning up energy supply. And then one mixed option pathway, which would be a combination of both. And what has the assessment found? Well, I think this is quite consistent with what previous assessments has, have found. A pathway which focuses on demand side measures has much higher co-benefits and a much lower risk of trade-offs compared to some of the other pathways. So this is a clear indication if the EU would go this way and put a high emphasis on demand side measures, then it could achieve its objectives with higher co-benefits and lower trade-offs compared to an approach which is primarily focused on supply side without addressing demand side. The report doesn't go much further in, into what policies would be needed to achieve this. That's for the second report, which will be, uh, which I will present in the next slides. Um, so it's a very comprehensive report, um, so I will keep it very brief. But overall, the advisory board has, rec has identified 13 key recommendations to keep the EU on track towards its climate objectives. There are things that should be done now in the near future to keep the EU on track towards the 2030 objective. There are things to be done um, already in the short term or can be done already in the short term to, put the, to keep the EU on track towards 2050. And there are things that might need some more preparation to implement uh, to, keep the, uh, to achieve the more ambitious objectives after 2030. And one of these key recommendations, which is closely linked to circular economy, is the need to better address energy and material demands, very shortly summarized. But it's a high level recommendation to say, so far the EU has, or EU policies have mainly been focusing supply side um, improvements, but demand side improvements uh, have been under addressed and also progress uh, on that area has been more limited. And this is what is shown in the next slide. We have uh, assessed progress over a wide range of indicators, uh, both greenhouse gas emissions, but also things at a more detailed level. So you could say the underlying drivers of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and what is noticeable when you look at this progress assessment is that in particular on the man side indicators, progress is either considerably off track or even heading in the wrong direction. And this is, something that we found to occur quite consistent across different uh, sectors. Um, and here, as Diana has also flagged already, 
in industry where we looked at the circular material use rates, we see that this is has been improving only very marginally in the last 10 years. And we really need a step change here if we want to achieve the objectives for 2030 and remain on track for 2050. So this is a bit the underlying rationale of why the advisory board saw it fit to put this need to reduce energy and material demand up to the level of one of the 13 key recommendations. And, and they really believe that this is essential to keep the EU on track towards its climate objectives. Now, what does this mean for the different sectors? If we go to the next slide, what we have done is we looked at different sectors for which we developed an assessment framework to see what are all the changes that need to occur to keep that sector on track. And then what does this mean uh, in terms of policies? Well, first of all, if we look at the uh, industry sector, there the advisory board has identified an overall need to lower demand for greenhouse gas intensive materials, as you can see in, in, in the flow chart here on the left. And there are several ways to do this. Um, you could either uh, reduce demand for these materials by reducing overall product demand, for example, by product sharing instead of individual ownership. That's one example. Um, you could also look into material efficiency and substitution. So use less materials to produce same uh, products that deliver the same functionalities. And finally, you could also make materials more circular so that at the end of life of a product, um, you could reuse the materials to make new products. And on all three of these, uh, progress so far has been quite limited um, based on the data that we found. What are the key policy recommendations that the advisory board has identified here? Well, first of all, and I think this is again quite consistent with what Diana has, has told before uh, me, um, the advisory board has seen that the Circular Economy Action Plan of 2020 is a step in the right direction mainly because it takes a broader view on circularity and not just recycling at the end of a product's lifetime, but more also upstream looking at how to design for circularity, how to design for repairability, um, durability, these things. So it is a step in the right direction, but of course it is still at the time that, that the report was written, it was still very much just an overarching strategy with a lot of the legislation still to be adopted and then even more so to be implemented at the national level. So one key recommendation here is to operationalize the good elements of this circular economy action plan and put it into practice. A second major recommendation here is to phase out free allocation under the EU ETS. There were several reasons for the advisory board to recommend this, but one of the reasons that they uh, that they included in the report is that because of this approach, um, of free allocation to address carbon leakage, you undermine the price signal downstream the value chain for operators to be more efficient with these materials. So that was one of the arguments they, they put forward to um, phase that free allocation and to develop alternative measures to, to address the issue of carbon leakage. If we go to the next slide on the building sector, here again, one of the key outcomes deemed necessary to decarbonize the building stock is to reduce overall energy and material demand, um, which can be done by 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 a range of, of uh, levers. Um, and one of the key recommendations of the advice board here is that the EU should take a broader perspective at uh, buildings energy use. So far, it has been really about reducing the energy, the final energy need per square meter. Um, here, the advice board has said you need to take a broader approach, you need to take a life cycle approach, reduce buildings energy and material demand over buildings lifetime, and also address uh, the overall square meters basically that you need. There are ways to um, incentivize more compact buildings, uh, more multifunctional buildings, which could also be considered as a, as a circular economy measure if you interpret it in, the, in, in a broader sense. Uh, and the report then puts forward a range of policy tools that could uh, be put to use to, to achieve this from spatial plannings to building codes, but also price signals, for example, they raise the issue of land value taxes to incentivize more compact housing um, and, and more mu multifunctional buildings. And then finally, one last slide that I wanted to show is on the transport sector, where again, um, I think a lot of 
things can still be done, or the report states that a lot of things can still be done on reducing demand for energy intensive transport in terms of moderating overall transport demand, but also shifting to more efficient uh, transport modes. But also on the supply side there, one of the key findings of the uh, assessment was that current EU legislation actually incentivizes, we, we have legislation in place that incentivizes the uptake of zero emission vehicles, and in particular electric vehicles, which is a good thing, but how the current legislation works is that it mainly incentivizes the uptake of heavier, uh, heavier vehicles uh, with larger battery packs, which are much more resource intensive. Uh, and so that was also one of the key recommendations of the report. These policies that the EU has put into place towards zero em emission vehicles are good, but they should be readjusted to ensure that they don't only incentivize uh, zero emission vehicles, but also resource and energy efficient uh, zero emission vehicles, which is currently not the case. I think in, in, in a nutshell, these are the main messages that have come out of the advisory board so far with, uh, with respect to the circular economy. Um, and now I would be happy to take any questions uh, for clarification. Um, yeah, so with that, that being said, Thanks again for your attention and looking forward to to answer any questions you might have. Many thanks, Peter Willem. That is uh, extremely useful and I think indicative of the quality of uh, work that the advisory board uh, has produced and continues to do so. Um, and if I understand, reflects a broadly based set of expertise as well, which is one reason that it's obviously very uh, comprehensive and, and thorough. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, I know we don't have a huge amount of time, but I, if I just pick up a couple of points from the from the chat, I don't know whether there is anything from your work that would help in terms of principle to try to reduce the fragmentation between the different uh, areas under consideration, because obviously there are many elements that that need to be considered comprehensively for this to work. Is there anything that the advisory board has done that in in terms of principles that would help, uh, let's say, coordinate or harmonize the approach in, in a better way than is done at the moment? Mm -hmm. Maybe we just start with that question to begin with. Um, very good question. Um, specifically on circular economy, I think the work so far has not gone into that level of detail, but broader, from a broader climate perspective, um, the advice board has recommended that according to the European climate law, which also found the advisory board, mm -hmm. there is an obligation for the commission to assess the climate consistency of every measure they propose. Um, and there we have found that this is has been done quite effectively for what you could say primary legislation, so regulations and, and directives. But when it comes to delegated and implementing acts, it's not being done, whereas these are often very important. Even if they are only secondary legislation, they often uh, determine very important details. And we see that the commission there is not doing this consistency check. So this is one area where the advice board has seen need to improve uh, the procedure that has been put in place to ensure coherence. But that's mainly on, on the climate aspect. It's not that much focused on yeah. circular economy, but it, I think it could serve as a general principle, not just for, for climate, but also for circular economy objectives. Great, thank you. Um, and just another uh, sort of question of clarification almost. You mentioned in your four points at the outset that circular economy can help achieve climate objectives. Does your work not suggest actually something more strong than that, mm -hmm. that it is essential in order to reach climate objectives that we're much more effective at becoming more circular. Can it be reinterpreted in those terms, if you want? Uh, this is a, a, a sine qua non, if you want, mm -hmm. to be able to, to reach our objectives. Is that fair? I, I would have to check the exact phrasing of how it was phrased, but at least in the spirit of, 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 of the report uh, and, and based on the discussions that were had, I think it it can be confirmed that indeed it will become very difficult to achieve climate objectives if we don't do this. Very, very difficult. I don't know if they have gone so far as to say it's impossible without it, but it would be very, very difficult and with a lot of uh, trade-offs and negative side effects that I that I can confirm. Thank you. Well, obviously, with the, there's a lot on demand side measures that we're 
going to be considering as well. And you've obviously spoken about that too. Is there anything specifically with regards to, uh, let's say, businesses that you would draw attention to being, you know, a priority from from that perspective from your from your report? Um, could could you rephrase the question a bit because it's not hundred percent in, in terms of how what what we should. Um, what what should businesses in this mm -hmm. context do with regard with regard to demand side mm -hmm. uh, levers, if you want, that we need to consider? No, no. Well, the the report is or the reports are prim prim primarily aimed at at policymakers. So it's more really about what should policymakers do uh, to incentivize businesses to 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 leverage these demand side measures. Um, one of the things that are in there, uh, which was also mentioned before, is the role, the important role of green public procurement, which is not yet being done or used as it could be used. Um, another one which is very prominent throughout the report is price signals, making price signals consistent so that for businesses it makes sense to do what needs to be done to, to, to reach the objectives. And then the report also points to other non-price barriers such as permitting, product standards, those kind of things. Um, but I think that the main, the main message throughout the report is that it should make sense for businesses to do this and policymakers need to make sure that the framework is as such that it makes economic sense for businesses to do this, and that's their role. Yeah, uh, we, we cannot expect businesses to to act against their own interests. Um, Wonderful. Well, we're about to turn to some businesses to hear their perspectives on this as well. So um, you're very welcome to stay. I know you said you needed to leave before we conclude, but um, thank you uh, for that. And just before you go, then, is there anything forthcoming that you mentioned that you are working on that we should have in mind in terms of dates or when publications mm -hmm. will be mm -hmm. coming out that we should be particularly interested in following from from the board's activities? Yes. Um, so for this year, there are two major reports on the agenda. One is on carbon dioxide removal, and then another one will be on agriculture, which are two hot topics at the moment. So it's a bit less linked to circular economy. But then looking beyond that, the board is aware that agriculture is a big challenge, but also industry and material demand is a big challenge. So I, it's not been decided yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if in 2025, the advisory board would turn to how to decarbonize energy intensive industries and that could also include a big role for for circularity very good thank you for flagging that and uh, we will hopefully remain in close contact with you um share ideas and information obviously between ourselves so um uh, i will let you go now but as i said you're very welcome to stay and listen to the next session until you have to leave mm -hmm. um but maybe we can uh pass over to our next uh speaker who i think is claudia um from uh ball claudia bf um so we're now going to hear from three members of the uh, task force um and i'd like to welcome claudia first of all um great to have you with us again thank you for joining and uh the floor is yours um to tell us your perspectives on this so over to you Thank you, Martin. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to to share um, my views here. Uh, just uh, a little bit of an introduction. Um, I work for Ball Corporation, which is a leading manufacturer of aluminium packaging, and the largest um, uh, part of our business is um, alu aluminium beverage cans, and we also produce aluminium bottles and aerosols. Um, we've heard already on the impact of um, the Circular Economy Action Plan and other key uh, circular economy um, uh, initiatives. Um, I'd like to point out the most important legislative and initiative for my company and industry, the packaging and packaging waste regulation. Can we move to the next slide, please? Um, so on the PPWR, we have a provisional agreement now, uh, which is hopefully uh, adopted by the end of the year. Um, the PPWR provisional text is in our eyes um, a very good compromise um, because it at least sets some key minimum requirements um, to make packaging more sustainable. 
uh, and also reusable. Uh, including um, uh, defining whether and to what degree packaging is recyclable, um, setting requirements for separate collection systems across the EU, as well as introducing mandatory deposits uh, return schemes uh, for beverages. So for us, mandatory um, DRS is the single most important outcome um, out of the PPWR because we really need to cl close uh, the circularity gap, uh, which then substantially will help us um, with the decarbonization of our products. Uh, and that means first and foremost, high collection rates and uh, recycled content rates across Europe. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? A ball is the largest manufacturer of uh, aluminum beverage packaging, and the vast majority of our emissions comes from the aluminum we purchase. And since producing recycled aluminum generates um, uh, 95 percent less emissions than producing primary aluminum, the key lever in our climate transition plan is circularity, as you can see on the slide here. Um, for instance, around 50% of our uh, carbon reduction pathway by 2030 will come from reaching a recycled content of 85%. And we can only achieve that with uh, reaching about, above 90% recycling rates. And for that, we need a systemic change in Europe, um, which our DRS deposit return schemes will hopefully help us to achieve that. Um, uh, also mentioning that to ensure that we have enough material going back into our cans, that would be uh, also important to reduce the leakage into other applications, uh, because right now a lot of uh, used beverage cans are going into the construction and automotive sector. And there's also uh, around 10% still being landfilled. Um, which is, of course, a total uh, waste of valuable resources. So deposit return schemes offer a chance to close that gap. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? So having kind of underlined how important circularity is for the uh, decarbonization of our products, um, I want to stress that so far the extent um, that circularity and circular economy um, have to contribute to reaching um, the EU climate targets um, hasn't been acknowledged sufficient, sufficiently in our view. Um, more than half of the, our greenhouse gas emissions come from our material use. And the scale of the emissions reduction needed by 2040 is quite different for every sector, of course. But for aluminium um, alone, the global capita per capita consumption must drop by around 17% by 2040. Um, this is according to a European Environment Agency report. So quite a lot. Um, Despite the progress mentioned uh, already by Diana, um, especially in um, individual member states, um, the EU single market and competitiveness uh, report has recently confirmed that circularity is only slowly progressing in the EU. The resource pro productivity has uh, somewhat improved, but not the material footprint. And um, there's still quite a low use of secondary materials. So acting sooner and more ambitiously on reducing material consumption um, is key to reduce the scale of the overall challenge to decarbonization. Uh, so that we don't end up using our whole carbon budget while we're working towards the net zero targets. Um, so this means, of course, moving much more rapidly from the very inefficient linear economy to a circular one. Uh, in a CLG Europe meeting recently in February, uh, Kurt Vandenberger, the head of DG Klima, pretty much acknowledged that. And he also said that to reach the EU climate targets, we need to close the circularity gap and that the next decade has to be about um, dematerialization. So um, maybe let's look at the next step. 
um, I already said uh, that uh, a circular economy is needed for uh, decarbonization, but it also will help uh, to make the EU more secure and uh, resilient. And uh, of course, as acknowledged uh, earlier by the speakers, uh, it also has a good potential to boost employment, um, expand resource productivity and also slash costs um, and reduce maintenance costs. So becoming the global leader in dematerialization will and help uh, will help ensure the EU's competitiveness, but we need a, a really big scale systemic transformation, uh, which requires large scale regulation. So how can this happen? Um, of course, one uh, thing we need to do is implement uh, the existing and still soon to be adopted Green Deal legislation. Uh, with a circular economy um, tangents such as the PPWR and expand them. We need a far more clearer vision of a circular economy agenda that also outlines a clear materials and resource strategy. That also means we need to move away from uh, a waste mindset. Um, uh, to uh, materials and resource mindsets um, that fully acknowledges the contribution um, of materials to tackle the climate crisis. And in this context, I, I like to point out um, uh, a recent report from Unomia. Uh, I think De Diana mentioned uh, it's at the beginning. It's called Managing Materials uh, for 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius and a EU regulatory framework for a low carbon material economy. Um, this report makes a, um, a range of recommendations um, to foster prosperity in, in Europe and make it more competitive uh, while uh, reducing uh, pressures from the consumption of our materials. I'm only picking a few policy examples here um, that I find very discussion worthy. Um, so the first one is to replace the waste framework directive um, with a materials framework directive. So moving uh, the mindsets uh, to help um, managing the resources, including waste, um, uh, more through a lens of resource efficiency and circularity uh, that when then that will then help uh, make room for for policies uh, that drive uh, decarbonization. For um, example, um, uh, you could reduce material uh, consumption through material taxation at a EU level, and, and also member states could introduce um, a materials application hierarchy uh, that helps then direct. Um, the use of more appropriate materials and specific applications um, to reduce the environmental impacts. Another proposal is to redefine the uh, waste hierarchy uh, by introducing a more granular approach um, to recycling and residual waste hierarchies um, and distinguishing between dry materials and um, organic materials and ranking them based on avoided emissions. In terms of uh, product uh, policy, um, there are uh, a few uh, EU harmonized policy measures, um, including a couple that uh, Peter Willem just mentioned. So the first one being uh, product taxation at EU level, uh, so to send price signals um, that incentivize producers then to offer more resource efficient, uh, sustainable and circular products um, and also encourage cons consumers then to choose them. Um, another one is uh, using the EU's large spending power for public procure procurement to uh, promote more circular products and circular business models. Um, and a last example is harmonizing EPR, uh, ex extended producer responsibility scheme designs across the EU, uh, the scope of the products uh, covered under them, um, the reporting requirements, and also the criteria for um, the modulation of fees across the EU. Um, going forward, um, 
we need to have a far more integrated policy approach from the Commission uh, when it comes to circularity and uh, EU climate targets. And so for, to achieve that, we need to have uh, the people working at the different DGs, DG Envy and DG Klima actually talking to each other and collaborative work on um, uh, design and implementation of uh, legislation. And given the current multiple crisis with raising ed energy cost, inflation and cost of li living, we need to make a far better business case um, for industrial and economic innovation opportunities coming out of the circular economy and what that means for uh, the EU or industrial strategy and how that translates into actual benefits and uh, prosperity for people uh, in form of jobs, et cetera. Um, and uh, yeah, not just the urban elite as it's perceived uh, nowadays. Um, so maybe one measure would be to um, engage much stronger with uh, trade unions and get their support. Yeah, that's about uh, it from my side. Um, looking forward to any questions you have. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, so much food for thought there in terms of what uh, can and maybe should be done. Um, so we're not short of ideas here already, uh, but thank you very much for that. And um, we may, if we have time, obviously come back to some questions on it. But I think uh, we'll pass immediately over to our next uh, speaker, speaker uh, Katarina Roca from Saint-Gobain. So Katarina, welcome. And um, over to you. I uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Hi, hi, uh, Martin. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me well? Ah. Yes, Celine. Yes, it's Céline from uh, from uh, from Saint Gobain. Should I should I continue? Yes, it's okay. Yeah, yes, thanks. Please, please thanks. continue. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for thanks for having me. Um, very inspiring comments already made, uh, and I picked uh, the continuation on the uh, cooperation mentioned just uh, just now as uh, something that resonates very strongly with what we are doing. Um, Thanks, uh, Céline Carré, Head of Public Affairs with, uh, with Saint-Gobain. I'd like to reflect today a little bit on um, yeah, what the EU has put in place in the past years, not only the past five years, a bit a bit longer, but then I illustrate a little bit what we're doing in Saint-Gobain and how it's that interact, interacting with the policy context. I'll reflect and suggest a few, a few ways for, forward. So you can move to the next slide. Um, Yes, yeah, so our sector is, um, yeah, uh, the first consumer of raw material and the first producer of solid waste. This is something we have to address, not only to use less um, virgin non-renewable resources to, to, to reduce the dependence on raw materials, to reduce landfills, to, re to increase recycling and uh, reuse. Um, in terms of global drivers, um, it's first scarcity, we see it for, for, for sand, we see it for, for gypsum, but it's also the link that was mentioned with uh, the climate challenge. A recent uh, study from the World Economic Forum says that circularity of materials in our sector can reduce up to 75% of emissions um, in uh, construction uh, materials. So we also have the driver of policy, but also the demand driver, some of our markets are already asking for a circularity for reuse, for recycled content, for recyclability. So things are moving, but it's not very homogeneous. Can move to the next slide. Um, yes, and you can click one. So here I'd like to pick uh, a few item, a, a few items that we see how moving have been put in place, are developing, but where more work is actually needed. So the waste from our directive, we have this target for construction demolition waste, uh, but the challenge is that it's by weight. Uh, so the driver is less relevant for lightweight materials such as uh, yeah, gypsum, uh, mineral wool or other product that, that we have. We struggle also with lack of harmonization regarding uh, definitions, um, recycled content or recyclability. You can click once more. 
Then moving on, the way shipment regulation, good thing it's been just uh, revised, but then implementation may take time. And the question is whether it's enough to overcome some of the typical challenges that we face when, um, um, yeah, when 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 shipping uh, ways such as different classifications, such as also authorization, administrative burden linked to the um, simple um, acceptance of secondary materials in our processes. So this is sometimes taking far too much time. Packaging, packaging waste just been mentioned. There are also challenges with implementation. This is new. Our sector is super fragmented. Lots of, I mean, a majority of uh, SMEs and micro enterprises. And then, yes, um, visibility, what is uh, recyclable, what is reusable um, packaging. On the construction product regulation, the famous CPR, which is uh, about to get the final vote, I think it's in two days in the European Parliament. Yeah, uh, the, the aspiration is very high, but it will take time. So there we will need the full capacity in administration and in the whole sector to, um, to implement circularity elements are not necessarily going to be integrated first. So the first requirements are on the um, global warming potential of materials. So here again, preparedness will be very important. And some of the typical challenges for as with um, reuse, so the legal framework and the um, insurance uh, the market needs are not just sorted with a, with a CPR. And moving on with the two other items I'd like to flag here is levels the sustainability framework. It's a very powerful driver also for uptake of circularity in the sector. The question can be regarding the impact and the driving role. And I would also raise the question of how it can better interact with other initiatives, such as the new European Bar House. Um, sorry for the acronym here. By the way, the festival of the new European Bar House is this week in uh, Brussels, and there we're looking for more synergies between different initiatives. Last but not least, EU taxonomy. There we have criteria at the building level. So this is relatively new. Here we will be tracking the impact. How much is it actually driving for sustainable finance to, um, yeah, to, to, to incentivize uh, circularity? Um, and then we could also reflect on where to put the incentive it is now at the building level could it be also at manufacturer level to incentivize um, uh, circularity there so moving moving on so that's um yeah the um the drivers quickly yeah this is on what we do in uh, in in Saint-Gobain. i'll i'll send you the some of the formatted uh, update slide but it's okay i can i can deal with it um, yeah, so it's a very, um, it's a completely integrated dimension circularity in our sustainability strategy. You see here the, the main objective to reduce the pressure on natural raw material, especially for exhaustible uh, resources, to optimize the use of resources, to accelerate the transition to circular model. And there it is a very powerful driver and it takes time but it's about creating the ecosystem. It's about partnering with all the players. It's very local. So we need to deal with suppliers, with the customers, with the specifiers as well, the end users and the public authorities. Um, the, the objective are completely embedded into our sustainability um, 2030 objective. And we would direct all of our actions towards those three levers, accelerate, improve the circular flows, uh, strengthen the circularity in uh, operational performance, so it can be the manufacturing processes, it can be innovation on materials, uh, product solutions, and then also managing waste um, in the in the value chain, reducing the waste generation, increasing the recovery. You can move to the next slide, quickly illustrating that we would inject uh, those three levers on um, all of the life cycle stages of our products and materials and how they then evolve in buildings. So what I'd like to point to here is that in all in all of those dimensions, what we do is very strongly linked to the level of maturity of the local ecosystem. So for example, the incorporation of recycled content, 
is very is very much linked to the our ability to collect uh, secondary raw material, which is then linked to also how mature the sorting and collecting ecosystem is. Same for modularity. Uh, when we think uh, flexibility of usage, um, prolongating the lifetime of a building and repurposing, this will also be linked to how local practice can adapt and also to the training of the people. And then on the deconstruction side, we note that more transparency will come with uh, building logbook or um, a digital product passport implemented via the, the CPR, but this will take time and for reuse, much has still to be done. If you move to the next slide and I'll be quick, you can you can uh, review the slide afterwards. This is just illustrating in those three main areas what we do. So incorporation of um, recycled content. Uh, for glass, for example, there is a very strong link between decarbonization and incorporation of recycled content. This has helped the innovation in uh, ORAE, um, our, our, our low carbon glass. Um, I would flag also maybe in terms of usage, uh, the modular and adaptable solutions. So for example, we use we were, we were able to use that for um, the Olympic Village uh, in, uh, in Paris, because much of these areas, spaces created, will have to be repurposed or um, changed in terms of uh, used. And the construction there, we also work a lot with uh, solutions towards the end of life, but also with uh, waste collection management services for um, insulation, for mortars, for gypsum or for glass. Now back to um, um, uh, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Thanks. Yeah, back to what can be done. Um, I think that um, a lot has already been said, but we are aiming for continuity because continuity in the circular economy agenda will give us the um, the capacity and the capacity buildings in all the stakeholders. It takes time to create those ecosystems and the impact. It's a bit as if we had bits and pieces of the puzzle, but they need to be placed in the in the right order, and they need to be complemented by additional pieces of the of the puzzle. So the economics has been mentioned. None of what can be created in terms of regulatory driver can work if we don't work on the cost of uh, landfilling. Then the collection ecosystem, it's very important as well. We need to mainstream deconstruction. I mean, demolition is not an option. We need to think long term. Um, extended producer responsibility in our sector cannot come out of the sky in one day. It takes 5, 10, 15 years and it needs to be a material chain uh, approach. Um, elements regarding clarifying uh, definitions and lifting the administrative burden would be very important. So in a nutshell, we have those bits and pieces. We need to link them better. We need to complement and create impact. Thank you very much. Thank you, Celine. Apologies again for the misintroduction, but that's extremely clear. And I think we can see even in different uh, sort of business areas and value chains, very similar themes emerging from what we should do better in the next agenda. And um, with that, let me uh, now turn to uh, Katerina, hopefully uh, the right Katerina um, <laughs> this time. So um, welcome to you as well. And uh, we look forward to hearing uh, your perspective too. So thank you, Celine. Welcome, Katarina. Hi. No worry. We and uh, me and Celine, we are working together very much. So, so yeah. of course you can. Uh, so thanks for having me today. I'm. I'm. Uh, thanks for uh, having Rocco to share some thoughts on how to create the economy and and uh, a better circular economy. So going directly to the uh, to the presentation without further ado, just very quickly. Rockwell is the largest producer of stone wool, uh, which is mineral wool, and uh, we produce these products for insulation application. Uh, we also uh, use stone wool for growing media, uh, what's so called Grodon, that it's a horticulture substrate. We also produce the same or we use the same material stone wool for rock panel, which make exterior cladding. Uh, then lapinus, which make a special engineering fiber, and then rock foam, which are the ceiling tiles. And what we experience over circularity can be actually spread all over the different brands. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Okay, so circularity is actually 
not new in the uh, let's say in the Rockwell DNA. Rockwell has been taking back Stonewall from from the market for more than two decades now, uh, and in fact, our rock cycling system uh, program um, essentially helps the construction sector to fully exploit Stonewall recyclability, thus avoiding it ending up in the landfill. Uh, so, as you can see, we in 2023 we have expanded rock cycle uh, to additional country like India, China. China and Slovenia reaching a total of 21 countries um, and therefore getting very close to the target of having this take back system offered in 30 country in 2030. And um, I wanted to be very, very, let's say, um, clear on what are the tipping points or how do we see that we should improve in the circularity uh, in the legislation in creating conducive legislation to support those uh, those manufacturers those industries that are committed to create circular uh, program so we can go to the next slide so this one is a very basic scheme right um in which you essentially see the problems divided in three different phases what you call the building side problems the logistic and then the end use or what could be the uh, uh, the results of of recycling or reusing the product, right? So either in the factory for being recycling or in the building to be reused. So let's start from the very beginning. Uh, it has been said many times and, uh, and of course, one of the biggest problem is that we don't have the construction practices we actually look more or we we sorry we do demolition practices and we do not deconstruct how can that be solved well first of all like claudia was reminding before also coming from the study that was mentioned we need to look into waste as a resource and not as something that you should get rid of we really need to shift the mentality another element that i will go back to later, um, it's also to create very clear targets on recycling and reuse. Today, the Waste Framework Directive has merged target for both of them, and for us that doesn't work. Uh, you need to separate the waste stream to, to, sorry, to separate the targets to be able to set uh, requirements on each of them. Um, another important element to be able and to enable the manufacturer like Rockwell to go and pick up their own waste is to separate waste codes. It's useless to say that today you have two waste code for all insulation product, those that are uh, containing hazardous and those that are not containing hazardous. But all the insulation product are merged together regardless they are recyclable or not. And that it's already creating a big issue. We can give you the example of, of Denmark, uh, where our, our headquarters is, I mean, Rockwell is a Danish company, but there is where we see one of the most successful um, uh, waste back, uh, sorry, uh, amount of waste coming back to Rockwell. And that it's essentially because there is a very, uh, let's say, uh, um, exercise mentality on the fact that stone wool needs to be separated by the other uh, waste source and it would be actually recovered uh, by by Rockwell. So that's very important. I know that the waste codes, um, essentially, there is no intention to revise them, but that would be instrumental. Then, as my colleague Celine was saying before, there is also the need of clear definition. One of our efforts that the Commission is doing is a guideline to the audit, like at the building site, um, um, audit to sort different type of waste streams and what can be recycled and what can be reused. But there is one practical problem to that. How can you say if a product is recyclable or not? You don't have a clear definition. You don't have C label indicating whether the offcuts of that product that you are producing can be recycled or not. And that for me, it's another very important element that the construction product regulation should solve. There should be like on the C label, wherever you want to put it, some very explicit, explicit essential characteristic telling you whether the product is recyclable and recyclable at scale. Uh, really like if there is anything that can be offered to the customer to take back the product. Then if we move from the building side and, and no, sorry, can you stay on the, thank you. 
um, if we move from the building side and we go through the logistic uh, uh, wider defined, first of all, to decide where my truck is going to take my product, either to the landfill or back to the factory, um, it's something that we really depends on the cost of landfill. We talk about circular economy, we need to talk about the economy behind circularity. We need to create this economy by disincentivating the landfill of recyclable product which, by the way, is already part of the Landfill Directive, which is establishing that by 2030, the member states should enforce this ban on landfilling. But it's not actually implemented, if not in very few uh, few um, countries. And that's that I and as I said before, we should also have separate targets for reuse and recycling, not merged one if we want to create, uh, um, again, uh, economy behind the uh, what is going to go in the landfill, what needs to be diverted and what can be reused. Another example, Germany is a successful country for taking back our mineral wool. Why? Because, of course, there is a high demand. We have, we have talked about that. Second, there is a ban on landfill for recyclable product, which is confronting practically the, the construction company to ask themselves, and then what? Where I should bring it? Is there anything out there for me that I can use? And then, of course, they found us. And this can cre also can create for Rockwell a steady production of waste, which is also one of the biggest problems when you are manufacturing a product, not to have a steady flow of waste coming to the factory, because you need to program all your, uh, let's say, production, your recipe. And if you don't know how much waste you can take back, that, of course, will disencourage any type of, of use of waste. Um, again, uh, transport should be should be supported by some sort of fast tracking. We are not, we need to stop thinking that we are transporting waste. We are transporting a resource, we are transporting a secondary raw material. So we should green list specific waste stream, or we should also uh, try to um, facilitate the process for having harmonized end of waste criteria. Last but not least, the EPR, Extended Produ uh, Producer Responsibility. Um, it's another important mechanism that can help us. And it's uh, even better, like, uh, like Claudia was saying before, harmonized throughout Europe. Uh, the third more successful um, country in our take-back scheme is France. And it happens that they have the Extended Producer Responsibility there. To last point, uh, recycling, of course, when you are taking the waste to uh, to the factory, you are still recycling waste in, if, if uh, again, um, that requires a lot of, um, let's say, permitting burden. And I think that the Commission should commit itself to develop tools that can fast track the permitting yet keeping safety and, and uh, exposure and anything that is important for the work is very high on the agenda, but let's say uh, uh, diminishing the uh, bureaucratical burden on, on, uh, on the manufacturer. The, there should be a very strong encourage, uh, encouragement of the industrial symbiosis. So what is your waste or what is your byproduct can be a resource for me. Um, and that should actually be very highly regulated. Today, we are facing the situation in which when you are we are taking back uh, slag from other, for example, uh, industrial processes in one country, it is defined as waste. In another country, it is defined as byproduct. There is no clarity. And of course, this also comes with the definition of recycled content. This is on the side of the demand. If if you set requirements on minimum recycled content, you will essentially trigger the whole system to, uh, to produce these waste to be taken back to the manufacturer. And last but not least, reuse. Uh, we are lacking harmonized standards on reuse. So today, if I want to reuse a slab of insulation or a ceiling tile, I need to do it completely under my responsibility. I need to choose what are the characteristics that I believe I should check to be able to tell my customers that the performance is still there. There are no harmonization. There is no way to, to do it in a way that it's guaranteeing level of playing field. And if you look at the situation, uh, Peter before was mentioning as uh, one of one very important element, the life cycle, focus on the life cycle of the building. 
that would be perfect if we could only have a definition of durability of construction product, because today we are also missing a durability a definition of durability on construction product, which is also confronting the customer to ask themselves, can I reuse the product? Is that meant to last 60 years, 20 years, 25 years? So that's another element that should be introduced to give the customer and, and uh, whomever wants to launch a business on reuse uh, product to know um, if this product is is essentially working, um, it's still working. Next slide. Can Very we just quickly. be quite yeah. brief uh, now? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, then, then you can you. skip that because I think that this is summing up everything. And then the last one is just to tell you that we have in our website a uh, circularity dashboard in which you essentially see what are our indicators, what are we taking into account when we are evaluating and where are we setting the targets for, for our circularity, uh, let's say, uh, ambition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. And sorry that we don't have more time because uh, obviously no we, <laughs> we could go on uh, much longer. But uh, again, lots of really interesting uh, detail as well as uh, sort of strategic perspectives there. Um, and with no further ado, because I know time is, is passing quickly, um, I'd like to part pass over to Eduardo. So Eduardo, uh, if you are able to start immediately, uh, the floor is yours. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Sure. Thank you, Martin, for uh, the invitation. Also, yeah, to Diana for organizing the event, and of course to Martina to, for making sure that everything runs smoothly. Uh, hope you hear me well. Uh, so we, we can yep. indeed go on. Uh, no presentation, uh, but uh, I yeah wanted to start by introducing myself and the reuse. Uh, reuse is the circular. Uh, is the European Association representing more than 1,000 individual social enterprises active in the circular economy. And uh, uh, for example, you can think of the mouse shops uh, in France, but also the Petit Rien, the second hand uh, clothing stores in Brussels, in uh, Wallonia, but also the many Oxfam shops in the UK and Ireland as examples of uh, what our members do. So there are already two keywords in our definition, which are social and circular. And social, because our members uh, uh, do work uh, a lot with people distanced from the labor market, and this can include the refugees, people with mental or physical disabilities, and so on, but also circular, because our members work on the reuse, repair, and recycling of about 25 uh, waste streams, which includes textiles, electronics, and furniture. Uh, so, by merging social and circular, we like to say that we give both people and things a second chance. And this has been at the heart of everything we do since 2010, the year 2001, actually, the year where Reuse was founded. And this will also not change in the near future, as I will explain in a moment. So I'm here to talk about circular economy, and I'm actually the person following circular economy legislation in Reuse. We do follow many files because our members work on many areas, but all of our advocacy efforts is driven by two main aims, which are quite simple. First one is increasing the alignment of uh, circular economy with the waste hierarchy. And the waste hierarchy is this principle that should be at the core of EU circular economy legislation. And in its, uh, in its most simple form, we can think of the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. And then the EU actually has a more uh, substantial definition in Article 4 of the Waste Framework Directive. However, we have seen that too often the focus has only been on recycling. So acting uh, once a product has already become waste and not enough on preventing the generation of waste in the first place. We know that applying the waste hierarchy leads to the best environmental outcome as it guarantees maximum resource efficiency with a minimum impact of the environment. But what we may not know, what may not be self-evident is that the waste hierarchy also leads to the best social outcomes. And this is actually our second priority, which is raising the profile of social elements within the circular economy. Because sustainable development is not just about the environment, it's also about the social and economic dimension. And the waste hierarchy can help uh, achieving true sustainable development in this case. This is because reuse and repair compared to recycling and especially incineration and landfilling are more labor intensive, which means that they have a higher job creation potential. And in the case of social enterprises, these are local and green jobs for people distanced from the labor market. So there is also something about inclusion here. 
Furthermore, the value of reuse items is protected and kept within the community. So once again, social and circular are the two pillars of our advocacy. And I think that we achieved some steps forward during the von der Leyen Commission and the last mandate, well, this mandate that's about to end. So we have seen a lot of different legislation under the second circular economy action plan. And uh, as Diana was saying before, we have seen legislation covering uh, all stages of the life cycle of product. So design phase, use phase, and uh, end of life. For the sake of brevity, I decided to focus only on three initiatives, so one for each uh, stage. On the design phase, uh, well, uh, we have to talk about the Eco Design for Sustainable Products Regulation, or SPR, because we know that up to 80% of the environmental impact <coughs> can be prevented through better design. And uh, we really think that extending the eco design framework from electronic goods to, well, virtually almost uh, all products in the EU market and setting specific parameters for, um, well, uh, circularity, but also establishing uh, the digital product passport. Uh, we all think that these things, if they're implemented properly, they, they will be really a game changer. So this is something really uh, important for us. On the use space, we have mentioned it before, the right to repair directive. Uh, this will make products easier to repair, both by, well, by removing uh, software and hardware obstacles. So um, for instance, no more barriers to software, or also there are provisions about uh, availability of spare parts. This is really positive, but also by increasing the visibility of local repair and second-end options for consumers. So we think that this should make repair more attractive to EU citizen, and so repair and reuse can be a real alternative to buying a new and uh, replace, which is something, of course, we think is very positive. Finally, there is the end of life. So uh, when products become waste, because we have to delay this as much as possible, but eventually products uh, uh, will become waste. And in this regard, there is the targeted revision of the waste framework directive, which focused on textiles and food waste. And for us, the textile aspect is particularly important because many of our most visible members work on textile collection and resale. And if you think about it, uh, charity shops have been the only actors involved in the circularity of textiles decades before the term circular economy was first uh, invented. So uh, as social and circular enterprises, we asked for this recognition uh, of the role of social enterprises to be enshrined in this legislation. And uh, uh, we think that we achieved some success because the term social economy was only mentioned two times in the previous revision. It's now mentioned 11 times in the commission's proposal and 17 times in the uh, parliament's position. So uh, we can finally see that reuse activities carried out by social enterprises are increasingly being recognized. And this uh, for a long time was not the case. So we think this is a positive development. So indeed, uh, there have been important step forwards in this mandate, and uh, we must acknowledge them. But there is still a lot more to do because the transition to a circular economy is still not happening fast enough. And this comes from official EU sources, not from NGOs. Uh, again, brevity, uh, time is short. Uh, I will only give you three key demands. Uh, first one is procurement. Procurement is 14% uh, of the EU's GDP, as we all know, because we keep repeating this all the time. But it's really a big, a lot of money there. And this public money coming from taxpayers. So it makes sense for us that this money should be used to benefit society and to drive forward social and environmental goals, not just uh, procuring what is cheapest. So this is why we need a revised public procurement directive. Second one is targets, more specifically reuse targets. And uh, I'm talking about both reuse products and preparation for reuse waste. And in, in our experience, you cannot increase reuse without separate targets, separate from recycling, because a target is a signal that gives enough incentives to stimulate the collaboration of involved stakeholders, but also an instrument that's flexible enough to account for the different situation in member states. So we do want reuse targets, and uh, I'm specifically thinking about uh, electronic waste here because uh, we already have a clear obligation for member states to calculate uh, and report on reuse rates according to a clear uniform methodology. So we have the data, 
And we also have plenty of examples where these targets have been implemented in several member states. So we really think the time has come to have reused targets uh, at the least uh, for electronics, and we hope to see them in the next mandate. The third one is really a big one, and it's sufficiency. And this is a term that the IPCC defines as delivering human well-being for all within planetary boundaries. Concretely, uh, it's a big concept, but about circular economy-wise, uh, it's about reducing our use of natural resources because we consume way too much over our fair share. And this is something that uh, a lot of NGOs and civil society are really pushing for because we realize that there is a need now, actually, it may already be too late. So it's really important to go on. But sufficiency is the aim. Uh, circular economy is how we get there. It's the tool. And we need both to meet the climate and environmental commitments of the EU, but uh, sufficiency can also rhyme with uh, resilience, resilience in a way, because uh, circular economy can reduce demand for uh, imported resources, boost the strategic autonomy of our continent, but also increase uh, reindustrialization. So this is something important. And uh, to conclude here, uh, a lot has happened indeed. Uh, last uh, last mandate, this mandate here about circular economy, but a lot more needs to happen. Uh, the issue is that we are hearing that there is fatigue about environmental legislation, and uh, it's understandable there has been a lot of legislation here. This fatigue is felt by businesses who have to comply with uh, a lot of sustainability requirements, uh, by policymakers who are actually shaping legislation. And most importantly, according to a lot of polls, uh, and unfortunately, by many EU citizens themselves. Because uh, so here there is a challenge for civil society, which is that saying that we must do something just because it's good for the environment probably will not be enough in uh, this new political climate. But this is not necessarily a bad thing. This can also be an opportunity and a good reminder that uh, environmental policies. Uh, successful environmental policies cannot take place in a vacuum where there are no social and economic consideration. Because the transition to a circular economy, just like the transition to uh, decarbonization, net zero, and sustainable development, has to be a just transition, or quite simply, there won't be a transition at all. So this is something really important, something that I felt uh, yeah, could be a good closure. For this so thank you and i'll be very happy to take your questions thank you eduardo uh, a very helpful reminder about uh, the importance I, I guess of the social dimension but also considering all of these issues uh, together uh, regrettably we are already brief sort of over time so uh, i think we will have to uh, not have our q a session but i would just underline that we're really keen to have input from everybody on this call and others into the report that Diana mentioned. Just heard the importance of the social dimension and, and how that is essential to this agenda. We've heard obviously from the Scientific Advisory Board, the underlying case, the urgency, and all of the possibilities that we have to do much, much more. And we have heard a clear set of business cases essentially for what needs to be changed in terms of policy for this to be an economic agenda that really makes sense. Um, and indeed, something that uh, is also highly relevant for the wider EU agenda, how the EU is actually very well positioned from a competitive perspective here. Many of the companies who are leading exponents of the circular economy are European, based in Europe, and developing these ideas in the European uh, Union, potentially, uh, extending them internationally beyond as well. So I think there's a there's a strong competitiveness dimension to this if we get it right as well. So uh, with that, let me just uh, thank everyone, all of our speakers um, for excellent presentations. They will be available afterwards as we've indicated online. Um, they were so good, uh, I didn't want to cut them short and therefore we don't have a Q&A, but as I underlined uh, just now, please do get in touch with us afterwards. Um, Many thanks, obviously, therefore, to, to all of them, but also to all my colleagues uh, who do all the hard work behind the scenes 
uh, and who make everything uh, that we've uh, done today possible. So thank you to all of you for that. Uh, and obviously, uh, most importantly, thank you to everyone for joining. Uh, we hope this has been a really interesting session for you all. Look forward to remaining in touch with you. Uh, and we hope that we'll be able to invite you back when we have uh, the publication of our report later this year, that we can continue this conversation uh, and indeed make sure that we're implementing this agenda with even more vigor and effectiveness in due course. So thank you uh, to you all. And uh, with that, I would just like to wish you all a very good uh, rest of the day, rest of the week, uh, and much success on this agenda in all of your activities. So thank you. And um, we'll see you again another time. Goodbye.